everyone. I think it takes a second for everyone to filter in. So hi, if you're joining us, this is Rosie. Hi. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Sorry, we're a couple of minutes late. We've got technical difficulties coming out of our ears. I definitely do. Um, and we'll get into why, because it's uh, something that Rosie and James of Piers and Casting have been doing recently that I want to highlight as much as we can. Um, uh, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. And, you know, we've been doing these seminars and webinars uh, for um, since COVID locked us all down. Um, things have taken a bit more of a turn, as we know, and um, I just want to say I hope you're all keeping safe and coping well under the circumstances. We have a really big US audience, and so, um, yeah, I just want to just mention it and, and make sure that you're all doing okay and just let you know that Backstage stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, and we're all doing everything that we can. You know, it's always been a real... Um, uh, something that we've always focused on is telling black and brown stories through backstage and making sure there's accessibility through the website and everything. But um, even more than ever, we're making sure that this, these are things that we're definitely thinking more about and, and working towards. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to start with that with you, Rosie. Um, you know, diversity for cast and directors is something that is just always um, at the forefront of, of what we're doing. Is there anything that you think that the casting community could be doing right now to um, address and stand in solidarity with, with everything that's going on? Yeah, I think um, there is a lot of opportunity now for us to readdress and open up conversations which have either been had in the past and not fully, um, fully kind of either actioned or rectified. Um, and I think there have been some great steps towards inclusivity as a whole in the industry but we're not doing enough um clearly and i think we need to be listening more uh, especially those of us who are perhaps outside um some of these communities wh who have been struggling or are currently struggling or are feeling invisible or unheard um, and we need to just be listening and we need to be taking action on how we um present um audition breakdowns how we talk to and about um you know communities that are not within our um immediate circles for example um and you know this is a this is a time for us to come together and start to action change i think as a as a, as a community as an industry i think this is really important um, we're very lucky that we've worked really almost exclusively on projects where we, the producers and all of the creative team have really championed diversity and we have worked incredibly hard to be representational um, of the wider um, community uh, in the UK. I'm not saying we've always got it right, but it, it's something we have always worked towards, but I think we can all be doing more. I think that's the message right now. So that's, yes. yeah. Yeah, for sure. And if anything out of, out of everything that I've come across and what everybody's seeing across social media and in the news, um, I have learned so much more about what the problems are that I might not have already been um, privy to. So drama training and the accessibility around that, we always yeah. knew that, but um, the treatment of uh, certain actors in those schools and um, the opportunities that they're given if they go there or if they don't go there is something that um, hopefully is going to be really highlighted even more so and, and looked at in the future. Definitely. Yeah. Well, um, I uh, we normally start these chats with a bit of COVID chat. So um, I would just like to see how things are going your end. I know obviously we're I'm really hoping that we're at the back end of this now, I mean, fingers crossed, but yeah. you any updates in your world in the theatre and overseas part of, um, of the casting work you do? Um, certainly in the overseas work, um, the clients are incredibly optimistic about driving forward. You know, there is a, a, an enormous uh, market out there um, that they want to, you know, get going again. So as soon as they can, trust that they will be. And that's everything from cruise ships to just overseas everywhere. Um, Theatre industry, obviously, again, people are really kind of raring to get things up and going. I know people are investigating, you know, what social distancing options there are until, you know, until we can return to whatever kind of 
we want to call normal that we had before. Um, uh, in the meantime, can I talk about collective creative initiative? Can I drop that in here? I, at this well, I would love you to, Rosie. Yeah, it was like top of my list. So please, yeah, tell us all about it. So whilst there's still a little bit uncertainty around kind of the live and performing arts in terms of, listen, this will come back. It's coming back. It's just in what format initially and then how long it's going to take for us to be in a position where everyone is comfortable returning to those workplaces. So in the meantime, um, James and I have been very fortunate. We've won some government funding uh, from Innovate UK, which is a, a UK, um, it's, it's part of the government and they hold co uh, competitions for all kinds of industry and people developing new research ideas and manufacturing and industry, all kinds. And they launched a competition for industries impacted by coronavirus. Um, and we applied for some funding and we won all of it, which we were sort of a little bit uh, stunned by because uh, it happened very, very recently. And we've been able to put up a 30 hour a week program uh, covering wellness, well-being, acting workshops, singing, uh, dance, um, industry q and So very much like what we're doing now, but covering agents, casting directors, uh, producers, directors, and also tax advice which is probably more focused towards kind of the British uh, market in terms of what our government is doing in of supporting self-employed, furloughing, etc. So these are going to be really regular um, sessions, particularly for, well, all of it really. And we've got six months of funding, so it's 100% free to access online for anybody around the whole world. And we can pay all the practitioners £30 an hour for their time. So that becomes more sustainable again for people not giving up their time, which the industry is so amazing at and have been so brilliant at coming together. And, you know, it's what's so amazing about, about, this um is that you know everyone was doing free sessions free one-to-ones free classes and it's brilliant but we knew it wasn't going to be sustainable for everybody in the longer term so to be able to offer this platform and also to compensate practitioners the focus of the first six months is only on uk practitioners so that we're we supporting the uk economy in a very small way but for that but the goal is to make this a longer term project hopefully with a wider global reach and to be able to bring in practitioners from all over the world and everyone then to have access to this online platform and as I say it's 100% free it's all streamed live on YouTube and then every session is uploaded to our channel so it's there for a month to access uh, as well if in case you're working or miss the live stream so uh, we're really excited about it we've got some amazing practitioners on board and we hope that this provides a little bit of connectivity um keep an ability to keep on top of whatever crafts they are that you you know would normally be going to class and workshops and connecting with industry professionals uh, a little bit of kind of we've got yoga pilates for dancers a uh, mental health q a so just a little bit of kind of support and also um you know training and development that's really our we talk about development support and and connectivity as being our kind of three main um kind of uh, that's our tagline really so that's what we've been up to and we'd love people to get involved so please spread the word so that's kind of our focus at the moment obviously we're hoping that all of our casting work will come flooding back very very soon but um, while everything's on hold um at least we hope that this gives people a little bit of um something to focus on something to engage with um it's not a one size fits all you know it's not a course it's not a uni course it's aimed at people who are already in the industry and want to kind of pick and choose sessions whether it's approaching Shakespeare, singing pop, learning to work your falsetto, hearing from you know uh, amazing you know world casting directors and agents and producers and just kind of having those moments to breathe as well and just reconnect with yourself so that's that's kind of the the plan so thank you for letting me talk for 20 minutes about that. <laughs> no but it's so important because I what I've really loved about this time and this moment for all of mm -hmm. us since March um, has been how much everybody has come together but you're so right you know is that sustainable as we go forward and um, when you when you announced the collective creative initiative I was like oh my god yes I'm so glad that that our community cast and directors and agents are um, so giving and generous with what they're putting out there and um, it also feeds back into what we were talking about right at the top, you know, accessibility and people being able to um, train themselves at home and, and do all those things. 
without the structure of what we might be used to. So, um, like well done, really well done. <laughs> it's really amazing. Did, yeah. Is it is it you and James that put up everything then? Um, started everything. Like did the website and the program. Everything. Everything and the project was I think they were supposed to support 400 businesses and then they had eight and a half thousand submissions and they made it 800 businesses um, So it just took a long time for everything to get into place We had nine days to do it So James was kind of building website at midnight and I was kind of whatsapping people that we knew saying Would you come and be a practitioner for the first couple of weeks and finding amazing people on Instagram and then all the social media it just yeah, it's uh, yeah, we've done it before but we've kind of, you know, we build businesses and things before and websites, but not normally in nine days. So it's, um, you can see the bags under my eyes. Yeah. But it's been worth it. The response so far has been amazing. And we've had people from South Africa and Germany and, and the States as well um, tune in and watch and feedback. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been worth it so far. Go <laughs> play. Amazing. So let's talk about your casting work. Um, yes. So um, you and James are Pearson Casting. Um, yeah, uh, how did you guys get into cast in the first place? So we were performers first, which isn't the most traditional uh, way in. Um, a lot of casting directors haven't necessarily been actors before. Some have. Um, a lot um, go straight and in turn and assist with other people, um, which is a great way in, or our agents first, or work in different areas of um, production, um, wherever that is. But we were actors, James had worked on the West End and done some TV, I did some presenting and we were musical theatre background really and we decided to go off and do one cruise ship contract together, we just got married and we wanted to sail the world. Anyway, we did 11 contracts and ended up working for um, a cruise line um, and they sort of said, you know, um, we'd written some shows for them and were working with them in more of a creative capacity, I knew that I didn't want to you know work on ships forever and you know uh we wanted to transition to other things and we said you know you don't really come cast in the uk much and they said oh well you know we do open calls and we just don't really find the talent that we want so we said well look, let, let us host let us do set up some auditions for you james had worked as an agent for a year as well um for a big uh, agent in london and so knew lots of people that way um but it was completely brand new for us and the, the company it was a norwegian cruise line said oh we're doing uh legally blonde the broadway uh you know musical and we'll just come over and can you set that up so we went oh yeah I, yeah we can do that yeah no problem and um, we did our first one and then from there we started casting more and obviously we were doing private calls and you know started to build those relationships with the agents and then from there we started casting more musicals and finding production cast for them as well and then um Aberystwyth with art center the lovely anthony williams was uh, who's a friend was doing legally blonde there and said would you come and cast that and then it kind of grew from there really and it was one of those things again being in Liverpool which is where we were based for the first six years um there, there aren't any other weren't any at the, at the time independent casting directors who weren't attached to a casting house or a tv show they were all in Manchester so people would call us up and say hi do you do children's casting like yep yep we do now yeah absolutely so you know <laughs> got our background checks and then you know a, a lot of it was kind of kids casting in terms of street casting so finding like you know actual real kids which we had all those connections with and so we started doing some ad castings and then did music videos and then obviously started doing plays and then so it just kind of grew from there and I think really it was that that thing that they always say of say yes and work out how to do it later not that we had no experience but certainly you know most people have gone and you know have been assisting somebody else in the casting office and I think there are times when we've sat and gone you know I really wish I could have sat in with you know Pippa Alien's office or just you know interned with with Jill Green or something and just knew what their system was as a comparison but also I think it's quite nice that we've built all of our own systems and I don't feel influenced in our casting style by anyone else so um yeah it's not it's kind of an unorthodox way into casting I suppose but um yeah and we still cast for Norwegian today as well as other cruise lines so yeah it's been, Great. Uh, it's been quite a journey yeah amazing so we we've had quite a lot of screen casting in the states we've had some theatre casting directors but in the in the UK for our content here you're the first um 
more focused on uh, musical and, um, and theatre. So we're going to dig into loads of, um, and overseas. So we're going to dig into loads of questions. I've had loads of questions from people um, who've already sent them over. But guys, if you have any questions, please do pop them in the Q&A box and I will get to them if I can. Um, what you say there about, you know, you and James having to just work things out for yourselves and not knowing if you're doing things the right way. I actually do think that that can help to break down some certain systems which might be in place already. So right. I quite like that as um, the start of something when you're just like padding it out and seeing what works and doing it in the ways that you feel like in your gut should work. I think as well, coming from the angle of having been performers and really recently, I mean, we were still performing in 20, uh, in 2014 when we'd started casting already. So we still had that like little crossover. We were going back and doing things for companies we'd worked for before, like fill-ins or like last minute replacements. And I think it, all of our casting kind of stemmed from this place of what is it we want to feel like when we walk in an audition room? What, what do we want to undo? And that, that thing of, you know, it being elitist, it being exclusive, that thing of if I haven't trained at the right place, if I don't have the right agent, if I don't have the right CV, that shouldn't exclude you being considered or coming in the room. And then we talked a lot about, you know, what do we want this casting process to feel like? How many times have we sat by a phone or an email waiting for a response? So that's kind of exactly as you say, I think rather than kind of going, well, this is how we this is how things have always been done. It was kind of how would we want to, a casting house or casting company to treat us or to, to run. So that's always been our ethos really. And I'm not saying it's always been right or everyone's always loved it, but you can't, you can't please everybody. You can't, you know, you have to do what you can do, but um, yeah, no, definitely it's not come from anyone else's kind of ethos or system. Yeah. And you're obviously doing, like just fine <laughs> you're doing great so it's working for you and <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk about the process of casting for um for a musical because there's all these other elements that come in that you won't get in a screen audition so could you break it down for us a little bit what that kind of looks like when you are running casting sessions for that side of things yeah, of course. So yes, absolutely. You've got so many different elements to take into account. Someone has to be able to dance at whatever level potentially is in that show. Um, vocal, obviously, and then the acting as well. Um, and I think it gets forgotten how, how many skill sets a musical theatre performer needs to be able to bring into a room. Obviously, it depends on the musical. So for example, we just cast a revival of Rent, um, which has been postponed, but is opening this year, which is going to be amazing with uh, Luke Shepard who is the uh, director of Anne Juliet. Cool. Uh, really really exciting um, and Katie Richardson is MDing who's the MD on six so it's going to be a fairly uh, impre amazing production I can't wait um, but um, for that there wasn't really a dance it's not really a dance based show certainly this production and it was more people who had you know an interest in exploring movement within a piece so the focus for that came down to vocal styling, um, a feel for the show, which is, you know, casting directors always talk about that. Are you the right feel for it in terms of your energy and your look and obviously age range as there is across all casting. So for that, it was very much, we wanted people who were rock vocalists, not musical theater, not pop, um, but really kind of like rock singers um, who had great um, connection to text, were great actors, were happy to work intuitively with a director. And then movement was kind of, no, there wasn't a movement call. In contrast, Six, for example, which we cast on um, in the West End UK tour and also on two Norwegian ships. So we look after four casts a year. No, actually there's two a year on each ship. So six a year currently. Um, it's a dance call first because um, we were running the vocal first. So we were doing uh, vocal calls for the show and then acting and then we were dancing last. And we were losing people that we absolutely fell in love with because the dance element of the show is so important it's so integral to the whole feel of this pop concert and Carrie Ann's choreography is amazing but it's it's technical in ways that people don't necessarily realize and stylistically she's going from jazz to commercial to you know a little bit of hip-hop in there and so people who cannot at all reach those kind of styles we had to let go at the end of the process so we switched it round um, so that we were dancing first um, because there are no ensemble tracks in six there's no way to be 
um, you know, oh, that's fine, you can just sing. Like in Wicked, they have tracks which are dance heavy or um, vocal heavy, for example. But uh, in this, everyone is on stage the whole show and have to have the same level of skill sets across all of it. So we dance first. And that also allows people to uh, come back and show us that they've grown in that style. So it's not a no forever if you can't dance it the first time. And then, then we sing people. Um, and the vocal again for six is just pure pop. There's no NT in there. There's no... Um, um, you have to be an amazing pop vocalist and the acting. So that's that process. It also, when you dance first, allows you to see more people because um, obviously we're always limited. Um, producers can't spend, you know, eight months auditioning for a show. So you get limited audition dates. So when you dance, you can have bigger groups and see more people, which is nice. So it completely depends on the show, but generally you'll have, generally we would start with, um, private call on your own material vocally may hear, might hear one or two songs uh then you'll be recalled maybe on some show material vocally then we might do some script work and then there'll be a movement or dance call towards the end is is the traditional structure but some shows just need us to flip it around same with 42nd street uh, which we cast last year for Upstairs at the Gatehouse and we had the associate choreographer from the west end and we had to tap people first because if you're not an amazing world-class tapper the show is not for you so it's very much case by case what is the predominant skill set or which skill set is going to eliminate more people first I suppose is kind of where you start um, so that you're not taking through people people through the process wasting their time that's the other side of it it's not just about wasting our time we don't want people to go through six days of audition process and missing work and recalling and getting excited and then finding out they don't have a key skill set for the show but it's it's very much sitting down at the beginning with the creatives and talking collaborative collaboratively about what it is that you need to see um, throughout the process and making sure that that's really balanced as well you can't just do song and dance and then kind of the director goes oh well actually on the last day I haven't seen anyone act so it's it's breaking up those days and making sure that you're seeing enough from everybody to make final decisions on the day so yeah wow so it's a long old process how do you is it um, a mixture of um requests requesting from agents and open calls how do you usually run it where people come to your attention or you invite people in so we'll always start with the creative team by asking who they want to see and generally directors, choreographers, MDs will have lists of their own of people that they've worked with before or people that come highly recommended. A lot of creatives we work with um, also work in colleges, teaching or doing workshops so they'll come and say, look, the so-and-so hasn't been signed with someone but I'd love you to bring them in. They might not be ready quite yet but I'd love to see them for this. So we get lists through which we are obviously just, just call those people in. It's just calling the agent saying, is this project of interest? The director has specifically requested them. Then generally we put a breakdown out. Um, on the whole, all of our audition calls are private. Um, again, mostly for time, but for six, we do try and do at least one open call a year um, so that we can meet talent so that people have the opportunity sometimes people's you know cvs don't reflect the skills that they have they don't put their cvs together in the best way or don't have footage that showcases what they can do so we do try and do open calls uh, for lots of different productions but on the whole um, we'll start with with private calls. Um, so a spotlight breakdown will go out. We'll also then pick up the phone to agents that we know and say, look, this project, I don't know if you've seen it, but let's chat about who you might have. Um, and sometimes, um, sometimes just having that conversation with an agent kind of, just kind of jogs their memory about somebody or will have people on lists. So we keep every single program of every show that we ever go and see they're all in our living room in bookshelves and the first thing we do once we've got the list from our creatives is pull every single program out and we start looking through and i think they go back to about 2012. um so actually it's really, a lot of people have left the industry pulled those people out for rent i was like they're amazing they're amazing i'm looking them on spotlight and they're oh now now they're an agent um that's just the way it moves on but um uh, but yeah, so we start with that and then we have lists of people that we've cast before or you always have those people that get to finals um, for a few projects and they're really brilliant and you want them to, to book a job and they don't quite for some reason and they're always these people, oh, we have to call 
we need to call that person back in I'd love to see them for this and then it, yeah hopefully they get that one um, so yeah and generally as a general rule um, we open it up to the whole of spotlight so anyone can submit themselves even if they don't have an agent there's a lot of reasons why someone may not be represented maybe um, it didn't work out with their last agent sometimes agencies go under or let people go if they haven't been working which you know there are a hundred reasons why someone may not have booked a job for a year or two or they might be between agents so we try and see as much talent as possible and also for our overseas projects um, not everybody wants to go and work abroad even if it's doing six they don't necessarily want to work on a ship for six months they've got commitments back here so by opening that up to everybody we, we find lots and lots of talent that um, yeah isn't repped for some reason so that's kind of where we start uh, with the casting process Amazing. No wonder you need two of you. <laughs> we do sometimes have an intern when we've been really, really busy. Um, we're working with an, a lovely girl recently, actually, who was just about to graduate from Chichester. And obviously everything's on hold at the moment. But bless her, she was sitting in the office just sending out audition slots. And she was like, I've sent out 200 emails. So I was like, yeah, keep going, keep going. <laughs> so yeah, sometimes we have interns to help out. But yeah, it yeah, keeps us busy. Amazing. So um, I know last time I spoke to James, um, which was on a CDA panel that we did with backstage. Um, he mentioned that you guys, just before we were, were all locked down, that you were in New York for the opening of Six over there. So what yeah. are the plans with Six going forward everywhere? Cruise ships, is it still, it's not one of the ones that's gonna get canceled obviously because it's so in so many places. But yeah, what are the plans with it going forward? Obviously, I don't want to speak on behalf of the producers because <laughs> they're not here. But um, I, as far as we're aware, everything will drive forward with um, six as soon as everything can come back in whatever format. That's across the ships and Broadway and uh, the UK. That's to my knowledge uh, today. Um, it does have a very kind of young, um, sort of vibrant demographic. Who I'm sure are really keen to get back in the theatres. Um, we weren't part of the actual um, six creative team for Broadway they used uh, an American team but we've gone over to support the British creatives and um, I think um, it was probably the comments generally were it was a real shame obviously for everyone to have gone and it didn't open that night but actually it hasn't opened at all which is a positive so when it comes back it can come back with kind of a you know a big bang and um, and get the success that it so deserves i think it's going to take broadway by storm but yeah as far as as far as we're aware at this time uh everything is absolutely driving forward and uh, everyone's raring to go again so amazing do you know what six is one of those musicals so i haven't actually seen it on stage yet i know which i'm devastated about but i know all of the words to all of the songs so um that is going to be something that is on top of my list as soon as we can get back to theatres for sure. Um, cool. So I'm going to um, ask you some questions from our lovely audience. Thank you so much again for everyone for sending these through. We've had some great questions. So um, uh, Pillar and Tilla has asked, um, will casting directors consider you for a role before you apply for a visa or to live and work in that country? um it's very difficult if you are not already eligible to work in that country i think it depends a lot on the production i know uh for example um a production that certainly was due to go out this year i think it's been rescheduled for next year had hired an american actor who was here already on a work visa and they've sponsored her forward but that is a production company to production company uh, issue and certainly with equity it's difficult uh, I know to bring people over and get that approved if they're not eligible already to work in the UK and there needs to be a reciprocal arrangement of some kind so I haven't I haven't worked on a production where the producers are happy to sponsor someone who is not uh, eligible to work here but again that will be on a case-by-case -case basis that's not the casting director's decision uh, that comes down to the producers Great. Um, what are the visa implications if you're working on a cruise ship? So they're registered generally. Uh, the big lines, so Royal Caribbean, Norwegian, cruise line, um, uh, 
Regent, Oceana, Holland America Line, they, these ships are all um, registered in the Bahamas. So as an American citizen, you can come on and off them with no visa unless you need something specifically to visit a country. Like in Russia, to get off, you have to purchase a visa. Um, but uh, if you are not an American citizen, you will get an offer letter from the cruise line that you're working for. So you audition for them first. And then um, you go to the US Embassy, wherever you are, and you get a C1D visa, which um, lasts 10 years in your passport. And that is basically a crew in transit. So it's the same if you work on an airline as an air hostess or, uh, sorry, I don't know what, air steward. And, um, and uh, then you can uh, go and trans, you know, go on the ships and it allows you in and out of America um, without uh, any kind of other visas. And then you can either go and rehearse that on an ESTA, like a holiday visa or a B1, B2. Um, so all that process gets talked through, but if you're an American citizen, uh, generally you don't need a visa to work on American cruise lines. I don't know about British ones. I don't um, cast for any British ones. And I think on the whole, they use British talent. Cool. Okay, great. Um, Alal, uh, well, uh, uh, Elaine Varney has asked, um, is it always best to sing a song from the show for which the actor is auditioning or to sing a song from a different show that showcases the singer's voice and range? Yes, the second one. So generally, um, sometimes we send material in advance. So we might say, look, we don't have time at first rounds to listen to everyone's own material. So we might send you something specific from the show or ask you to pick something from a selection. Um, that just narrows down who can actually sing the material physically from the show. Generally, find something that's in the, the similar vein of the show. So if you're going in for Rent, for example, you know, memory is not necessarily going to showcase the right style. Um, so, but pick something that suits you, that shows you off, shows your range. Don't pick something that's too big for you or that you've never sung before. Um, and make sure that you're just really, really comfortable. Prepare, prepare, prepare. That's all what we always say. And, you know, if it's not, you know, something else um, by that particular composer or is slightly out of the box, like, I don't know, if you're going in for a Lloyd Webber, but you think, right, I'm going to take some, I don't know, Rodgers and Hammerstein, that's kind of not, but it's similar, just own it, just go in and sing it. If you sing really well, you connect to the lyric, you tell the story, and you show that you understand and can connect with the style of the show, then you'll get a recall, basically. Great, cool. Um, Eve Kong has, uh, has asked, um, how is the industry adapting to social distancing measures and coping with COVID in regards to filming on set or rehearsing on stage? What does it look like, as far as you know? As far as I know, so the TV and film industry is, is different and will get up and running a lot quicker. I know that they're looking at putting different measures in place. I think it's neighbours in Australia. I think they've kind of had like social distance sets where people have kind of gone in after a quarantine period and then worked together and they've limited the number of people on set and they have social distance filming so they're all doing it six feet apart which i think is a lot more um achievable and practical on a day-to-day -day basis there are so many issues around social distance um rehearsing and performing live theater forget the audience you know backstage people you know, dressing each other, being in a small space, connecting on stage. You know, we were talking the other day with Arlene Phillips um, on a Q and A, and she was saying, you know, how do you how do you do a dance piece without touching somebody else? Um, but it, I think processes are in place to look at what all of the options are, and I think some of the best creative brains in the world are looking into this that people are crying out for live theatre again um, and that connection with live performance and I think as soon as it can come back it will um, so hold tight they're looking at it <laughs> great um, Sarah Hill has asked do cruise liners normally only recruit for musical musical theatre or are there straight acting roles as well um, yes, there are. So on different cruise lines are different shows and productions. Um, I know at one point Cunard had um, some actors on doing plays. I mean, Private Lives was on P&O cruises for a while. Um, I know that um, Norwegian Cruise Line has some other spoken word things happening at the moment, which I can't remember off the top of my head because I don't cast them. Um, but um, there are straight acting um, 
roles or shows, uh, plays, etc., happening on cruise lines. Uh, and again, the, their programs are changing constantly um, in order to adapt. And um, before this even happened, you know, they're constantly reviewing what people want to see and um, keeping things fresh and new. And I think the whole production show concept is just changing. The idea that the only entertainment is singers and dancers on a stage, whilst people still really love to see that on holiday, I think they, they are opening that up into a variety of different um, variety of different uh, genres as well. You know, um, as an example, I know Holland America Line, for example, have started uh, Step One Dance Company is, is now going on there. So it's a dance only piece um, by these absolutely phenomenal dancers and they travel ship to ship, kind of replacing the traditional concept of, um, of you know, four singers and 10 dancers. And again, like I said, not that that's not what people want to see, but just kind of opening up the horizons of what entertainment means on ships. So keep an eye out because things are being added and changed all the time. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what they're all gonna come back with when they all come back. So watch this space. That's great. Um, Madeline Manchebo has asked, um, are you still accepting submissions and doing vir virtual auditions during quarantine? Um, there is nothing certainly in our world happening right this second. If you want to write to a casting director um, or to a production company, um, I know, for example, some cruise lines are accepting online submissions and doing online auditions so that when everything goes, they've got a pool of people ready to go. Um, so find out individually what's happening with each um, casting team. Um, we, for example, are very happy for you to write to us and say hi if you have never written before and introduce yourself. Just know that nothing is currently happening. Um, so we'll put, pop you in a file and come back to you later on when something's right. Um, I do think as we start to move into opening everything back up, there'll probably be a lot of online auditions and self-taping um, happening at the initial stages so that when we can get in the audition room and work with people in the rehearsal room, uh, we've been able to at least connect with people online first. So um, if you are somebody who works in musical theatre and is not used to self-taping, start practicing now. Um, you know, find a nice neutral space in your home and get good lighting and good sound um, so that when you do get to send tapes through that you've had that practice, because I think that is probably where we're all going to be um, starting. So yeah, have a look. 100%. Um, Grace Fallibaum has asked a couple of questions, but they're all great questions, so I'm going to ask them all. Uh, so firstly, um, do you have any tips on calming stage nerves? You might have mm -hmm. some from when you performed or some that you wish that you could give to performers before, before they were in a casting or going on stage. Uh, so I think stage nerves and audition nerves are very very different um i think um you should always be slightly nervous before you go on stage because i think it keeps you on your toes so um don't worry about having nerves i think that's very very normal and everyone deals with their stage nerves very differently same with auditions so some people like to have that buzz backstage and be chatting to everyone and that kind of and some people need to be on their own and have that moment of breathing and just focusing so find what works for you um generally i think once you step out on that stage and the, the spotlight hits you kind of the nerves just fade away and you do your thing so I think um, I think everyone has their own way of coping some people um, uh, you know find that some kind of mindfulness beforehand and just you know calming the nerves down is very beneficial audition nerves I don't think ever leave you mine actually got worse as an actor it's one of the reasons I stopped um when I was in my 20s I was like oh it's a free dance class well yeah I'm just going sing and you know not whatever my gosh I still got nervous but I was much more kind of like oh it's just another audition in another day and as I got older I think I put much more pressure on myself and I was much like you know what does this mean if I don't get this job what does this mean and um I think um again you know find what works for you before you go into the audition room um, just have that moment and try and leave any nerves outside and take the pressure off yourself you, you know we've all gone into audition and hit a bum note and any good casting panel will you know give you a moment um, they want you to be right remember that no one, no one sits on a casting panel waiting for you to trip up or hoping that you're wrong we've all invested so much time in money in booking studios and hiring the team everyone there's on a day rate the producer is literally like paying out money like this 
the casting team, my God, our stresses. There you go, our stress on the first day of auditions. You know, Monday, 10 past 10, we've had three people drop out and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is the first time I've worked with this producer. I hope some people come in. I hope the first few people are good so that we can all, you know, relax and have like, you know, a laugh over a coffee because the morning's really horrible. I'm going to have a really bad day. Um, so know that we are nervous for you. We want you to come and do an amazing job. So take that pressure off yourself. Come in and try and enjoy it. I suppose um, especially if you're coming into you know musical theatre you're doing a dance class or something like that just think of a dance audition so think of it as class just take that pressure off and just know that most of us have already been there before particularly directors choreographers MDs have generally um, a lot of them have been performers before or have worked extensively in the industry and we know how nervous you are so take that pressure off yeah Great. Um, Madeline is also, uh, sorry, no, Grace has also asked, um, have you got any advice on how to get a good and healthy belt? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, just be, just be safe. Um, find somebody, find a singing teacher that you really trust. Loads of people are doing really great online um, classes at the moment. And you just keep everything very forward. And here's the thing, focus less on creating a belt sound and much more on connecting to the, the lyric. So a belt or any kind of vocal dynamic should come out of an organic place within that character or within that um, scene. The reason that we belt is to, to amplify the emotion, not just to create a loud sound. So the more you can connect that down psychologically into the lyric, into the text, the better overall your vocal will be. So um, don't try and run before you can walk if, if creating a belt sound is new to you create safe belt sound, sounds in the middle of your range and sing songs that um, don't tire you out quickly um, and make sure everything that you're doing is safe that's the best advice I can give you and just for anyone who um, doesn't know what a belt is because I had to google that so um, <laughs> what what define belt what do you mean when we say belt uh, okay so belt so we would talk about um, uh, oh, gosh getting very very technical um so i suppose if that would be kind of as you go up into your register and you're connecting the lower um vocal force so it's not in your head voice it's not ah, it's here ah, would be there and then so you're creating a kind of crescendo of sound and tone and emotion so if you think about um the best example of belting would be the end of defying gravity that is what's classed as a belt but again that should come from a place of amplifying um uh, a, a tonality not just volume uh, and it's a connected uh, the folds are very uh, connected and it's not inside your head voice that is that's where I would class about I'm sure I'm going to get lots and lots of vocal technicians going absolutely that's not the definition of belting but that's that's what I would say yeah amazing but I learned something really important there so thank you <laughs> um so um somebody has asked uh Oh, actually, we've already done something quite similar to that. Um, so Alicia Brady has asked, I'm a British American actor currently living in LA. Um, I'd like to make the move and come back home. I wonder if you have any advice for someone who is a dual citizen like me living in America. So um, just probably just any advice about anybody returning back to the UK and trying to find their way in the, um, in the industry again. Yeah, well, um, first of all, amazing that you have dual nationality, that the work that that opens up for you is amazing. So look on that as an advantage. Um, I wonder if you still have any friends or family over here um, or anyone connected with the industry. There are loads of amazing ways um, to, you know, when this opens back up, even now online, to go to class and start connecting with people in London that way. Um, I don't know if you're... Um, uh, um, a drop were you acting dramas or musicals or I don't know really what did she say what her background was uh no just um no. Just an actor, just as an actor. Um, find out, you know, there, there'll be some great classes at Actors Sem Temple, Actors Centre. Um, you know, there are great, um, you know, vocal coaches who are available online who then will start to connect you with people. Um, get on Spotlight. 
Um, at the moment, that is the key tool we are using. I know you guys don't use that really in the States. I know there are other um, tools, but over here, certainly, um, Spotlight is uh, the best way, um, to, certainly within theatre, to get yourself seen. We're also using um, casting networks um, over here. So, um, yeah, I think uh, just connecting as much as you can within the community in terms of classes and sessions and workshops. You don't have to spend much money, but kind of connecting with the industry that way and Spotlight certainly um, will help. Uh, and just write to agents as well. Find out who the agents are in the field that you want to be uh, working in over here and just write to them and write really great letters with really great CDs and send footage. And um, you know, if you get representation, that's obviously going to, to be helpful at this stage. Great. Um, Sarah did also ask earlier, um, any tips around dance auditions? So say if um, somebody is really interested in musical theater, but they haven't been to a dance audition before, like I have no idea what a dance audition looks like in practice. So could you break down one that, that looks like how many people you'll be dancing with? I have some sort of idea in my mind from probably an American film, but yeah, what do they look like for you? I think it depends on the uh depends on the show so if you're going to an open call know that you are probably going to be um with between two and five hundred people um our last six call we had over 700 people turn up um so generally we try and dance in groups of 40 or 50 so even for a private dance call um you're looking at a, a room uh with about 40 to 50 people in it hopefully there's some space but it is going to be quite crowded um, and generally a choreographer will be at the front and they'll break down a combination into smaller sections um, and teach that. Um, they will often switch the line. So with 50 of you, there's going to be a kind of quite a dense collection of people. I'm making this sound really bad, by the way. It's not, we run our dance auditions really lovely. It's, it's very friendly and warm environment. Um, but generally there are a lot of you. So make sure you can see. That's really important. Don't be pushed to the back. Um, you'll find that people who have a lot of experience in dance auditions will make sure they can see everything so that they're not missing out. Not that anyone's aggressive, but make sure that if you are somebody who need, who's a visual learner and needs to see, that you're rotating through those lines and that you're at the front so you can see. So generally we'll learn that in that group of let's say 40 and then we'll break that down into a group of 20, group of 20 and then into smaller groups. So um, then we'll do it in groups of three or four so that the casting team can focus on everybody. We might do it twice, um, switching the formation round so that we can watch you and then we'll watch the next group and the next group um, after that. So that's generally how a dance call would work. Um, so just make sure you can see. Whoa, that sounds really fun but really <laughs> intense uh, but intense for me though because I, I would obviously not know what the hell to do in that situation but you guys are amazing that go to these auditions all the time it's um sounds great um so uh I, we're gonna be wrapping up there i just wanted to mention something else that i noticed that you and james are doing because i thought that it was, it was such a good idea um, and i want to see if you're still doing it, actually um, you've been doing casting surgeries where you um, give spe specified feedback to people on their um, CV and headshots and things like that. So are you still doing that? Yes, we are. Yes. So um, we started doing that about six weeks ago after we've done a number of these Q&As and people were saying, how do I know if my CV looks right? How do I, you know, what, what does my show reel look like? Is the footage working? Does it, will it get me in the room? Um, again, with the whole um, self-taping or online audition process, um, a lot of people aren't used to self-taping. If you are a TV actor and you're used to regularly kind of finding that space and doing it, then great. If you're not, this can be a little bit daunting. And there are lots of really basic ways in which we can offer a little bit of advice um, and just feedback, for example, on the structure of your CV or headshots. So yeah, we're offering those surgeries still. We do a website analysis, um, social media analysis, where we kind of have a little nose through your online platforms and just kind of feedback on ways you could improve your visit or um, sometimes people get engaged in kind of conversations about things that maybe don't reflect on them um, very well as a business um, you know if you are a performer and you're not having a great time on a contract or an actor and you're having a horrible time on set don't put it out on social media that can reflect negatively um, and cover letters if you're writing to casting directors or you're self-representing just looking at those so yes we are absolutely still doing those and we'd, we'd love to hear from more people so do write in they are a paid service we charge five pounds per surgery just for our time 
Great. So, um, uh, thank you so much for everything. I've learned a ton of stuff because I've never worked in theatre and now I definitely want to work in theatre. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, um, so, ways that people can connect with you guys. Casting yeah. surgeries are on your website, right? Yeah, pearsoncasting.com forward slash industry surgeries or if you go to pearsoncasting.com, you'll see um, a menu on there to have a look at those. Wonderful. You are on Twitter. What's your Twitter handle? Uh, Pearson Casting, <laughs> to think wow. about that. Yes. <laughs> um, and just reminds everyone of, of what your new um, initiative is called so people can go check that out. So that's called Collective Creative Initiative. Um, so we're on Twitter at CCI2020 or on Instagram, Collective Creative Initiative. And the website is collectivecreativeinitiative.co.uk. But that is open to everyone from all over the world. And we've got 30 hours a week of industry support classes and Q&A. So to, uh, come and uh, have a look and join in. Amazing. That's great. Um, thank you so much. If you want to tweet about today or post out on your social media, we love to see it. So um, Backstage is at Backstage on Twitter and at Backstage Cast on Instagram. <laughs> and then I'm at Hannah Casting, at, sorry, at <laughs> Hannah Casting on, um, on Twitter. Um, and also, guys, we, I don't mention this enough, but Backstage has so many great resources on the website in terms of giving you knowledge. There's loads of articles about the industry and what's happening right now and um, basic information that you guys need to know. I know a lot of you ask about visas and working overseas, and there's a ton of information which is on the website, which is all searchable. So go to backstage.com and check that out. We are going to be doing more of these. Things have gone quieter, of course, with everything that's going on at the moment. And we are um, planning going forward and, and uh, things will continue in terms of us providing all of this amazing content, uh, which we couldn't do without people like Rosie. So thank you so much for coming and joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun. I've talked a lot. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I, no, I love it because I, I don't know so many of those things that you've just been speaking about. So if anybody has us on um, gallery view, they could probably just see me looking at you like, whoa. <laughs> so it's great. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time. And I um, hope everyone stays safe and has a lovely weekend soon. It's not a weekend. Tomorrow. 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 <laughs> Wicked. Thank you so much. No worries. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye.